Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Syosset Public Library's Turn the Page podcast. I am here with my co-host, Jen. Jen. Sorry, hi. <laughs> And with our very special guest today, Ryan Britt, um, we are going to be talking about his awesome new book, Phasers on Stun, How the Making and Remaking of Star Trek Has Changed the World. So welcome. We are so excited to have you on our podcast here today. We're all such huge Star Trek fans. Um, Thank you. So, um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about like how your love for Star Trek started? Sure. I think I like like many people. It started in in childhood. Um, I was a fan of the original series before the Next Generation came out in 1987, but I was also really young, so I was like that rare child who had had you know I'm 40, so when the Next Generation came out, I was been six turning seven, um, and so I was aware of the original series and and watching the Next Generation was exciting to me because Lavar Burton was in it. Right. So we knew him from Reading yeah. Rainbow. And this is actually in my book is that uh, he told me when I interviewed him that he was like, oh, people tell me a lot that a lot that I was the um, I was the gateway drug to uh, Star Trek because in the 80s and the early 90s, you know, that's how we knew. So he was the most famous person to me on The Next Generation, which was true in real life, too, it turns out. Right. Like he was like huge in Roots and huge in um, uh, in Reading Rainbow. And he and Will Wheaton were much more famous than Patrick Stewart at that time. <laughs> um, so, which is in the the kind of the middle, um, yeah, kind of the, in the middle of the um, of the book. But yeah, so I, I childhood, uh, I would say the next, you know, the next generation crew were like my, my childhood friends. Um, and then, you know, as I um, kind of grew into becoming a nonfiction writer, um, I, um, you know, just started being able to write about Star Trek a little bit more and more. Uh, so that's kind of a that's a that's a short that's a big jump there I guess <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah Jen did you have like um what brought you into the Star Trek like universe oh me it's funny yeah. I, I also started with a uh, next generation and I I mm -hmm. followed it through DS9 and Voyager and then as an adult I um went back and watched the original series and then Enterprise and got into all the new ones too so I've been a Star Trek fan for a while <laughs> yeah I've been a Star Trek fan I watched from the 90s and TNG like they had the next generation was always like they were showing reruns of that so I I loved um the next generation I thought it was so sophisticated like the storylines were so complex but then I went back and watched the original series and I'm like, oh, next generation so cerebral, but I love some of like some of the campiness, like especially in the original series. And I think Kirk is definitely my favorite captain. So yeah, <laughs> we can see we're all huge Star Trek fans, but getting back to your book, Phasers on Stun, what made you um, start this project for this book? Sure. I mean, so I have been writing professionally about um, science fiction and fantasy, I guess for about mm, 15 years now. Um, and I had done an essay collection called Luke Skywalker Can't Read, which came out in 2015. Um, and then I got married and I had a kid and I kind of wanted, you know, a lot of time passed. And I didn't really get another book out right away. And so I wanted to do um, something with a lot of the um, nonfiction I've been writing about Star Trek anyway. Uh, professionally, I had been covering the news shows since 2016, kind of when the first whispers of discovery started happening. I was doing some reporting on that for Inverse and Den of Geek and Sci-Fi Wire and other places. And then when those shows started coming out, I, I was doing a lot of interviews and stuff. And I, you know, when you write uh, about things online, it's so ephemeral and it sort of disappears. And I'd always wanted to do a nonfiction book about Star Trek. Um, so I'd actually pitched my agent a book about the Wrath of Khan because 1982 was when the Wrath of Khan came out. So now it's 40 years this summer. Um, you know, just one of these, like, this was the most important movie that changed everything. And my agent um, wisely was like, this is good, but it's a little narrow. Um, and my, my, my thesis was essentially that The Wrath of Khan was so interesting because it was so radically different, in, but we now regard it as a classic, which is really odd. <laughs> and then I, once I 
kind of established that thesis, I realized that that's a trick that Star Trek pulled many times. That essentially, like, each version of Star Trek is radically different than previous iterations, um, with some elements that are familiar, right? Um, but even the most crowd-pleasing Star Trek, like the J.J. Abrams movie in 2009 or the new series Strange New World, still has, like, these extremely risky things that it does with the established continuity. And I was like, wow, so this is, the, this is what Star Trek is, is this radical change that then becomes the status quo. Um, so once that once I settled on that thesis, then I felt like I really had something special. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of pursued uh, figuring out how to structure that and how to research that. Um, and with with all of my writing, how to make it really accessible, like aggressively accessible to the non fan. Um, I always want to make the fans like ourselves um, feel like the book is for them. But I also wanted it to be for like, you know, maybe people who aren't like very online and maybe are a little behind on some of the new shows or hadn't thought about deep space nine in a while or whatever it might have been um yeah and and i i find because i find that sometimes those maybe you've never been to a convention i sometimes find that those fans are a little underrepresented and they're probably the majority <laughs> you know that's kind of the majority of people that watch star trek is uh, the people you never hear from so i always wanted to uh have the book be for them too no that's wonderful yeah um one of the things i actually really loved about the book was the tone um because it's a really rigorous uh, like history of the show and a really interesting like um, cultural criticism about its legacy and its impact on other media. Um, but it's also just like very funny and sometimes irreverent, you know, like there are, were many times when I laughed out loud reading it, like um, it, it was just like really cleverly written. And I am wondering like how you, um, yeah, how do you like split that difference between doing something that's like, you know, um, comprehensively researched and kind of comprehensive while still appealing to a kind of popular reader audience. Yeah, I, I've said this in a few other interviews, but because you are both librarians, I think you'll really understand this, is that it's just, I am deeply influenced by other books, hmm. right? Like, so I am deeply influenced by authors that I really like. Uh, when I first wanted to be a, a writer, um, I moved to New York when I was 23. This is way back in 2005. And my favorite writers were uh, Sarah Vowell and Chuck Klosterman uh, and Rob Sheffield um, and Sloan Crowsley a little bit. Um, and I was doing storytelling on stage at The Moth at the time before there was a podcast, before that was like a known thing. So, at you know, at that time, This American Life and those writers that I just mentioned were sort of this great inspiration for a way in which you could do nonfiction that was both informative but very voice driven. Um, and that was kind of the crucible that I was born in as a nonfiction writer. Like I always thought I wanted to be a, a start as a fiction writer. And then when I moved to New York and I was sort of like reading these authors and doing live storytelling, I realized that blending, you know, reporting, so to speak, about something real with, with a sort of memoir tone that could be funny was a way that you could pull things off. So like right away, I'm in my 20s, I'm reading uh, Assassination Vacation by Sarah Val which is this hilarious road trip book, right? But she's also like informing you about the history of presidential assassinations. Or same year, uh, Chuck Klosterman's Killing Yourself to Live comes out, which is a book about the how like places that famous rock stars died and a lot of history of rock and roll, but done in this very sort of like jaunty tone. So um, I said this to an interviewer recently, is like, uh, this is a style that I did not invent. I just don't think that a lot of people that write about science fiction and fantasy do it. For some reason, those books tend to be a little bit more earnest. I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> um, that just is kind of, you know, you read like some other great uh, books about Star Trek, right? The oral history of Star Trek, uh, uh, The 50 Year Mission by um, Ed Gross and Mark Altman. It's, it's you know, it's they're funny guys. I know them. But the but the, the, the writing itself is kind of like cut and dried, right? It's just kind of like this. these are the facts. So I just really enjoy reading books that are like the ones I mentioned. And when I was working on Phasers on Stun, I had just read Rob Sheffield's Dreaming the Beatles. Mm. I don't know if you have read that, mm. but I mean, it's like, why does the world need another book about the Beatles? But then you read Rob Sheffield's Dreaming the Beatles, you're like, this is why. And it has a really personal, and it made a topic like the Beatles just so great again to read about. Um, and, you know, I always say this, like Chuck Klosterman has this book, um, Fargo Rock City, which is kind of about heavy metal. And I don't really care about heavy metal, but I love that book. And I wanted Phasers on Stun to be like that, 
right? Mm -hmm. Like even if you don't like Star Trek or you think you don't like Star Trek or you don't like science fiction, but maybe you're interested in the history of television and pop culture that you could still enjoy it because there's something else other than just information. And so the other thing that I'll say about that is um, I, I said this to my agent the other day, actually, because I'm working on a book about Dune right now. Um, and um, the biggest challenge with a book of nonfiction about pop culture is not to have every single chapter be kind of like, and a lot of people don't know that. You know what I mean? Like it, it's it's tricky. You don't want it to just be a collection of factoids. You want it to really give the reader something else. Um, and so yeah, if you're not if you if you don't have you know if if you if you like something that's straight journalism and a bunch of facts, you may not like this book. <laughs> you know, I can see some kind of readers, and I've seen some reviews. Oh, this was too silly, and it's like, well, you, know, you can look at the back. I did a lot of research. Um, but um, yeah, I, that's a long-winded way of answering a fairly simple question. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. Yes. No, it definitely does. Yeah, thank you. Um, I thought you did a great job. Um, I think that people who are not even interested in Star Trek will be so, like, they'll think of this as such a personal, um, you know, writing, as you said, because you were talking, like, I remember reading in the book um, about how you were a little child, like, and then you had the haircut that was kind of like, like Spock and that, like, the fans, you know, identified with Spock so much. And um, that tells you so much about um, the character and people's love for Star Trek, that they identified so much with that character and how you go into the evolution process of a lot of the characters. Um, like um, with Ahura too, like um, how you describe like how her, um, the actress being on the show, um, it was such a groundbreaking moment um, for television and, um, it was such Star Trek just appealed to so many people. And um, I think that, you know, the love for something like that, people will identify, even if they're not into science fiction, they'll, they'll, like, they'll see that from their own perspective of things. Yeah, I feel like I've converted a few people. Um, there's a there's a memoirist named Fook Tran uh, who wrote that great book, um, um, Saigon, that came out a few years ago, 2020. And he lives with me here in Portland, Maine, and he did an event with me. And he was like, I was a Star Wars guy. And then I read your book and I would just now I'm like totally want to watch all of Star Trek with my kids. And I was like, that's the that's exactly what I'm going for. Like, that's where people are like, oh, wow, this actually sounds really compelling and interesting. And I um, it's also great because there's so much of it that you can just kind of like you know it, it's like well I didn't you know you, you could be like well I, I watched you know one of the Star Trek movies and I didn't love it it's like guess what there's a lot more of it that you might like you know what I mean that that's that's very different yeah I just love how um obviously the diversity and representation on Star Trek is a huge part of it but just from a writing perspective the narratives are so diverse there's so many different kinds of stories yeah. I always make a joke. I love Star Wars, but I always make a joke. I was like, Star Wars is pretty much redemption arcs and like revolutions, you know, and that's right. kind of it. You know, there's kind of not very many stories that they tell other than that, you know, um, coming of age stories, you know, Star Wars has got that nailed. But, you know, Star Trek has like whodunits and political intrigue and, you know, it has romance and it has, uh, you know, people grappling with the middle of their careers, you know, people grappling with the end of their careers, you know, like um, all that whole spectrum of life that's not just, you know, it's not just YA fodder and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I like that Star Trek is kind of like, it can kind of take, you can find a character at different stages in your life mm. and be like, like, I didn't really relate to Riker when I was a kid, right? But like now I kind of do, you know, in like the middle of the next generation when Riker is like, oh, what am I doing in my career? I was like, I get all of that angst now. You know, I know what that's like. Um, I love that Star Trek kind of dares to do that. Mm. And, still, and still does, you know what I mean? Still kind of says, these characters are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and they're still mm -hmm. relevant people. Mm. Yeah, something that I love about it is that it's like at once classic, but also like kind of refreshing to go back to. Because I first encountered um, like, as an adult, I went back and rewatched all of Star Trek starting around like 2014. And that was like kind of the peak uh, for TV of like shows that were about terrible people, you know, or like brilliant, like geniuses who are awful people to everyone they love, but like you tolerate it because they get the job done or something. And going back like in that milieu to watch Next Generation was so refreshing because it was just about a bunch of like best friends doing their best, you know, <laughs> like professional competent adults being nice and being skilled, you know, it's just like it's very it was so refreshing, you know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah no they're no it's great and i i something that i've i found a quote from marina Sirtis on the um 
one of the Blu-rays that's and that I put the quote in the book is that she was talking about how close the next generation cast is, right? And they all say this, like when you talk to any of them, they're like they they're they're always like, and it's real. It is real, like how close they are. I and mean, it really comes across. But that she said about how they would used to do um reshoots and that some of them would come back for the reshoots even if they weren't in the shot mm. because uh, for off-camera looks is the quote so meaning that they wanted to recreate the mood of the scene so even if they didn't need the the close-up of lavar or whoever um that they would still come to recreate the scene that, that that's how seriously they took their art and so then I think, and I, I write this in the book, but I think that what's so profound to me about that is like, so what we didn't see is just as important as what we did see. And I think that's come, like the next generation is about kind of subtext. And a lot of Star Trek is the more you think about it, where you're like, it's not necessarily that this episode like was this great message, because some of them are a little on the nose, but it's that just the, the, the subtext of just those people together creates this warm blanket. And I think that's true of a lot of the shows. Deep Space Nine, I think is like that too. Mm -hmm. um that you're just like i i almost as much as i've written about star trek sometimes i'm still amazed about how mysterious those vibes are <laughs> you know those warm vibes are so mysterious because a lot of times they're just based on on something that we don't see and walter Koenig, who played Chekhov, said that to me is that he felt like sometimes it was less about the stories and more about just the people being together and i thought that was really profound and and um and, and just wise mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I might be like in the minority for this, but I'm also a big fan of um, Voyager. I, I really like Janeway as a captain. Like I thought that she was great. Um, <laughs> she added like definitely a different spin on the other captains I think that we had had. And I thought that those those stories were definitely almost like a callback to some of the original series. I definitely saw like um, a circle with that. Um, yeah, something. I don't think that you're in the minority anymore. Okay. I think you may have been, Megan, but I think that now, I mean, I did a couple Star Trek podcasts a while back and they were like, we have too many people that want to do Voyager discussions. Mm -hmm. Like Voyager is more popular than ever, I would say, um, now. Um, but yeah, I totally agree with you that Voyager was like out to try to recapture some of that original series vibe, but with a different um, angle. Yeah, Voyager's great. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. One of the things I really appreciate about the book actually is how you recontextualize some of these shows and like kind of break through those like, you know, maybe like ossified opinions about it because like they're like conventional wisdom, for instance, is that like, you know, the animated series was terrible and that it was like just a cheap like, you know, like ploy for more money in merchandising and all that. And like the, the you know, misnomer that like Voyager was like loathed when it came out, you know, like it really, you put it in a new context and like you absolutely rehabilitate the animated series and like really like show how Voyager Voyager's reception has developed over the years. Yeah, the animated series, I, my love for the animated series has actually only grown since I finished the book because my daughter is five now and it's really the one that we watch the most together. And before it was kind of, she just wanted to watch uh, More Tribbles, More Troubles, which is the mm -hmm. Trouble Tribbles sequel on <laughs> repeat, which has the pink Tribbles that get really big. Um, <laughs> and uh, now she's sort of taken to it's actually Thursday night, so we will we will pick an episode tonight to watch together before bed. But she's taken to just sort of selecting them at random. And we watched this episode the other night called The Survivor, which is just about this shape-shifting... It's No one remembers this episode. It's this little shape-shifting tentacle creature who pretends to be the former um, sort of love of this a woman who I'm bored named Anne. And then it's really a strange, bittersweet episode. And my five-year-old was riveted by it. She was like, oh, the shapeshifter was nice. It was confused, but then it ended up being nice. And I was like, yeah, but it was like kind of like this complex and yet very gentle episode. And I was just like, oh man, there's, there's just no bottom into how great Star Trek is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, the animated series continues to delight me. It's not like, I, I don't know if I would say like tell everybody that it's the greatest one, but it's certainly, like I think I say this in the book, it's certainly more consistent than you remember. You know, like where you're like, that's a. My daughter described today a shapeshifter as something that can play dress up by itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, like, it was like the shapeshifter was turning into Kirk and Bones and stuff like that. But yeah, I love, I love, um, 
I love the animated series. Yeah, it's great. And the writing's really, you know, Yesteryear by Dorothy Fontana, where Spock is visited by um, his older self. I mean, had that been a live action episode, it would be considered one of the best episodes of Star Trek of all time. Mm -hmm. Maybe they should just remake it um, with Ethan Peck. They could remake it. <laughs> um, yeah. It's so interesting how we've had all these different um, reboots of Star Trek and different, you know, adaptations coming out. And like in your book, you do touch upon like the fan response to all of this. And, and that was something else I appreciated because like I'm not a huge fan of the reboot of the original series movies because they changed some major things that I was not happy with as a fan. Like that would affect other plot lines. So <laughs> that was just my... Yeah, Funny. those movies. Yeah. yeah, those movies are definitely controversial. I think that I am glad that they exist, but I will say I don't like Star Trek Into Darkness that much. I'd say that that would be the only one that I have a hard time rewatching, just because it's like a little bit too grim. Um, but I always find something, even in the ones that I that I don't love. I remember my my editor at Penguin, uh, Jill Schwartzman, was kind of like it seems like you don't like Star Trek Into Darkness. And I was like, you know, I rewatched it and I found something in it that I really liked, which was that Benedict Cumberbatch's con is on the loose or whatever, and Kirk has been told to kill him no matter what, right? But then Kirk says, they're going to go out the mission and they're going to like, it's like very Marvel, like, let's get this, you know, guy, you know? And then um, Kirk's like, no, we're not going to kill him. We're going to bring him in. And that's, in, and that's in defiance of Kirk's orders. And then Spock, Zachary Quinto's Spock is like, oh, this is great. We're going to, and that's, I'm like, that's Star Trek. That's great. So mm -hmm. I, I love little moments. Even so, some of the movies I don't love, I still find things that I love and that I feel like are true to the spirit. But I know what you mean. Um, you know, I think that everybody, everybody has their things that bug them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I thought it might be fun to maybe, um, for everyone to say like what their favorite episode was. Cause I know um, Ryan, you discuss in your book, some of your favorites and some that you think were a little like differed from like the whole theme of the series, like the core, like, do you have a favorite? Oh, that's tough. Uh, that's tough. I suppose oh, I keep saying different answers to this. Um, so what what will it be today? <laughs> it's tough because it's like I think that I could choose one from like the next generation or Deep Space Nine or, um, you know, one of those shows easily. But when you do the whole franchise, it's tough. I guess that I continue to say in the original series that I really love um, A Taste of Armageddon because it's very I, I find it to be underrated. And it's the episode of people don't remember where the Enterprise goes to a planet that fights its war with computers. And so there's no violence, but there is death that is unfair. Mm -hmm. And it's all very calculated. And they, they've done this because they've accepted that war will always happen. And so they're, they're just gonna, they're just gonna kill people based on calculations. And it's so, and of course, Kirk and Spock are profoundly offended by this. And you know, Kirk then uses this kind of reverse psychology to like, you know, he starts blowing up things and being like, I'm a barbarian. This is why, you know, and then his whole point is that, you know, you can't just pretend like it, you actually have to try to be better. Um, and there's a quote from uh, from A Taste of Armageddon where Kirk just talks about the history of bloodshed and how we can choose not to kill today. And it was spoken in this great show for all mankind, which is this Apple TV show that takes place um, in an alternate kind of space race. And it um, was created by Ronald Moore, who was a Deep Space Nine writer and later did Battlestar Galactica. But there's this uh, astronaut who quotes from Captain Kirk as she becomes the first black woman in space in this timeline, uh, played by Chris Marshall. And it's this great Taste of Armageddon quote from the original Star Trek. And I'm like, yes, like this show is like spiritually like gesturing at the spirit of Star Trek through this other sci-fi show. And I just was like, I remember talking to Ron Moore about it um, after the season aired, this was last year, and he was just like, yeah, you know, we're always going to talk about Star Trek, even in other shows. Mm. So I don't know, like Taste of Armageddon is, I think it's the one that, and it's so over the top, and Kirk is running around with a ray gun, and Spock is like mind melding bet a, a, like between walls. And I love that. Lots of nerve pinching in that <laughs> one. Um, I, anyway, so that's what I'll say for now. Mm. How about you, Jen? 
Oh, I think, you know, that's, that is really hard to answer. But if I were to answer just in terms of like the episode that I've watched the most number of times, it's Darmok, um, which is so great from TNG. And it's like a really good Picard episode. And I think it's like one of the episodes that like just does the best job of sort of like, I don't know, leaning one, leaning into one of my favorite traits of TNG, which is that like, you know, we're going to solve problems through cooperation rather than conflict. Um, and that there is conflict present, you know, because they're being stalked by this like monster that they have to team up and defeat. Um, but it it is like a, an episode that like does solve its problems without violence, you know, and I just, I, I love that as a, a an ongoing theme in Star Trek. You know, Jen, I, um, I recommended Darmok as the one episode for my editor to watch if she needed to know everything about what the next generation was about. I really felt that that episode, if you see it, you get why people love the show. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's so hard to choose, but I think I would have to choose one from the original series because that's still my favorite. And I just felt like um, A Mock Time is one of my favorites. If I had to think off the top of my head, that's the one where Spock has to go back to Vulcan and because they have to breed in his race every seven years. Otherwise, you know, they get all these hormonal types of things and they get very, you know, kind of sick and everything. So that one I thought was just great because it had like some of the campiness and then it did have definitely had violence in it, you know, but um, I think it introduced us to Vulcan. I thought it was a cool episode um, for character development too. Well, I've definitely seen that one a billion times. <laughs> did you see the new uh, Strange New Worlds episode, Spock Amok? No, I haven't. Okay, well, so all I'll say is the well so all i'll say about that is that to pring because strange new worlds <laughs> takes place before the original series so to pring spock's fiance is a reoccurring character in strange new worlds and the opening scene of spock amok is a dream sequence in which spock fights himself in the amok oh, time wow. arena where oh. one spock is human and the other <laughs> spock is vulcan and it's so good and it's got the music and everything that it's, sounds cool. It so, is amazing. It's so the fifth episode of Strange New Worlds, Spock and Muck, and that's the that I have ruined nothing for you because there's a massive other twist in the episode that I that, but it's very cool. And I was like, I love what that represented the idea that he's got you know he's he has this internal conflict, but it's so over the top. It's great. It <laughs> sounds great. Oh my god, yeah. Spock is just um. I feel like that that's what. Um, drew me to the series and like you you introduce like in the book and the pro like you talk about Spock a lot and I just felt like it like his character was just the core to a lot of like the series and the heart of the series so like I feel like he's so important so that's why I had to go with that episode <laughs> I agree you know and I think that once I because writing about the creation of the original series is actually really hard because uh, there's so many things going on once I decided to focus on Spock it became a lot easier Mm -hmm. because that and there's a reason he's on the cover of the book you know yes. what I mean yeah. is that is that that is a lot of like it kind of is another way of saying Star Trek you know um, and there's a reason why they brought him back in so many different ways in different incarnations mm -hmm. yeah well, yeah I have uh, one more question if you don't mind one of the things that I really loved about the book was um, how many interviews that you did uh, and some were done for this book, and then others were kind of glean, gleaned from previous interviews that you had done for other pieces of writing. Um, and it was just really exciting for me to see, like, um, how many of the actors are so thoughtful and insightful about the show and about the roles that they play and about, like, the impact of those roles on pop culture and on society. And you see how seriously some people took that, like, Nichelle, um, who, you know, really got into activism and actively recruited for NASA in order to bring more women and minorities into uh, the space, uh, in, into space exploration. Um, and I was wondering, like, who was, um, was there anybody who, like, surprised you at all with, like, particular insights about the show or about their roles? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say that you're absolutely right that there's no, people who are in Star Trek are so special and it all also makes sense is there's very few big tv franchises where you can think about people who like can go to conventions for the rest of their lives you know it's not like somebody who guest starred on law and order can necessarily go to a convention forever but if you were in like one episode of star trek you're good 
you know, you will always be able to have that. Um, I was interviewing um, Alec Newman today for my Dune book, who played Paul Atreides in the 2000 Dune. And he was in, episode, he was in three episodes of Star Trek Enterprise uh, with Brent Spiner, and he played Malik, who was one of Khan's followers, but in a different timeline. And he, he immediately just started talking about how much he loved being in Star Trek. You know, we were supposed to be talking about Dune, and he, we talked about Star Trek for 15 minutes. So people that are in Star Trek really love it, uh, love being in Star Trek for the most part. To answer your question directly, I got to say the person that was absolutely the most interesting and changed the direction of the book was Robin Curtis, mm -hmm. who played Savick in mm -hmm. uh, Star Trek III mm -hmm. and Star Trek IV. Um, Robin was really generous with her time. I cold called her. I left a message on her answering machine and she called me back. We ended up doing a couple really long Zooms where we kind of discussed everything. And you know, it it struck me that she was the first and only person cast by Leonard Nimoy mm -hmm. and directed by Leonard Nimoy to play a Vulcan. You know, and people are like, oh, well, she replaced Kirstie Alley. And like, as you were saying, the conventional wisdom is that Kirstie Alley was better and that they kind of had to find somebody else because the contract negotiations broke down and Kirstie Alley didn't do the search for Spock. But I don't know. I think Robin Curtis is amazing in the search for Spock. She has a really difficult role. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of uh, they kind of relegated her role to being uh, inessential by Star Trek Four, which I think is a real shame. And by talking to Robin about that, and she's really funny too. It's hard because she's like this brassy, hilarious lady, so she's like not Savick. You know, <laughs> she is the opposite of Savick. Um, but she's this she's this really kind, big-hearted uh, person. And um, but she also had a lot to say that was really like um, new to me. The idea that Savick was supposed to have had Spock's baby and they, they cut it out and that they didn't even film it, you know, but that that was her idea going in and that Savick seemed to be set up to be a bigger character and that she was thought she was going to be in like three more movies and um, and that Nimoy like taught her how to be a Vulcan and like so Robin Curtis was really like I I, I made a joke about this before but I'm sure there's some people that are like wow this guy spent a lot of time talking about Savick and Valeris. Um, <laughs> And uh, the reason why is because I just thought that those, um, it's a really cool moment in Star Trek history where they're introducing these younger characters who are the, um, like David, Kirk's son, and Savick, Spock's mentor, who are supposed to kind of be the next generation. And then they kind of don't go that direction. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I wanted to linger on that because it's so interesting to me. Um, and because Robin was so um, generous with her time and some of the great photos in the book she gave me. Um, oh. You know, so some of those photos of her with Nimoy, you know, like at the, at the, like no, nobody's seen those before. Um, so yeah, it's a small thing, but to me as a lifelong fan, it was huge. Mm, very cool. I just had one more question that's kind of connected to um, sure. Jen's question. Was there someone that you had interviewed um, that didn't make it into the book? Um, that you thought would have changed things? Or was there someone you interviewed after the book that you think would have changed the book um, if you had decided to write from, you know, a different perspective? Like, what did that? Well, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, could, I could talk about that for a long time. But I mean, at a certain point, the book has to become the book because it has to come out. Um, but, you know, I was doing uh, real time articles about Star Trek Picard season two and Strange New World season one and Lower Decks season two and Star Trek Prodigy, like as I was finishing the book. <laughs> So I was trying to like jam as much in from those things if they were related as I could. Like I even snuck in like a quote from an episode of Picard that had yet to air when the book went to press, but I knew would be out by the time the book was out, yeah. like in rewrites. So I was like trying to get it as up to the minute as possible. Um, and I am pushing for a paperback second edition that would be able to have mm -hmm. some new material in it. Um, but you know, the hardcover just came out. So, you know, get the hardcover, get the mm -hmm. audible now, you know, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, you know, I got to talk to Patrick Stewart after the book, after the book was oh, turned in okay. and, um, I didn't get to talk to Patrick Stewart for the book. So all the Patrick Stewart stuff there is sort of archival or recontextualized. And, um, I think that that's my answer is that I probably would have, um, I didn't get to talk to him for very long. It was for a junket for Picard season two, but I got to talk to him about how I got into the Christmas Carol because of him, because of his version 
uh, that audio one man show he had on cassette that was out in 92, I want to say, 91. But I have the cassette still, a uh, double cassette of him doing all the characters from Christmas Carol. So I told him that I got into Charles Dickens because of him. And he was like, that is very meaningful to me, Ryan. And then he was like, <laughs> Uh-huh. I probably would have put something in there with 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 that just because and I later I now all the next generation cast is returning for the next generation or for Star Trek Picard season three next year and some of them I wasn't able to get for the book and I suspect that that might be why that they were kind of in contract negotiations for <laughs> doing like more I was like I didn't get Marina Sirtis I didn't get Michael Dorn I got Brent Spiner who was super generous and wonderful um and I, I've interviewed Jonathan Frakes many, many times, and he's really great. Uh, but yeah, probably Patrick Stewart. You know, it's Patrick Stewart. Yeah, fair enough. Can I ask one more if that's okay? Yeah, that's great. Because one thing that I also really loved about this book is that, um, you know, obviously it serves as a history and kind of like criticism of Star Trek. Um, but it also is like a really interesting investigation of fandom and how it really found its origins in Star Trek and how active fans were like in the early success of the show and in its like ongoing legacy. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to ask about was like, when you are writing a book like this, where does being a fan end and being a researcher begin? Like, where do you draw that line? Like, as you are approaching a project like this? Yeah, I used to, you know, I've been an editor at a few different places. And when I was this entertainment editor at Inverse, I, I demoted myself and I am now just a contributing writer. But I used to always tell people that wrote for me, uh, journalist first, fan second. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that it, in something like this, when you do a book that's blending memoir, you get to do a little bit of both, right? Like, um, but I definitely think that it it comes down to thinking about you draw the line when you say is this interesting or is this just interesting to me um and that's where having an editor is helpful right somebody to tell you like this doesn't seem you know my my editor's like you got too many footnotes you know cut it this isn't interesting this isn't as interesting as you think it is um a, a casual reader won't understand this you know maybe we need to fix it so some of it is about collaboration with your editor. Um, and that's true of any piece of nonfiction writing that is being edited by someone else. Um, so there's that. Um, but I think that it's just, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that I wanted to include. I mean, so one example that I actually haven't talked about at all, Jen, is that I had intended to include more of a history of the way that magazines changed because of Star Trek. So Starlog Magazine was this big magazine that started in the 70s because of Star Trek. And then a lot of other publications existed because of that. And I even interviewed like the guy who founded Starlog. But you know what? It was just so in the weeds of being about magazine publication, right? Mm -hmm. That it ended up being something I didn't even include because I was just like, this is, this is breaking up the flow. You know what I mean? Like writing about somebody who making their own Spock zine is like exciting and you can like sink your teeth into that. It's really fun. But anytime something becomes like the history of the business of it, it gets a little boring to me. And there's a lot of Star Trek documentaries that are like that, right? Where it'll be like, the budget was this, and this is how much money they had. And, da, 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 da. and, and like some of that is fun, but I really wanted to avoid, I think I even say in the book, like it, it's not just complex business decisions in Hollywood. So I think that some movie nerds and film buffs really like that stuff. You know, like, but I, I, I try to really, it's also why I didn't dwell that much on the motion picture, mm. because that's a lot right. of like, that's a lot of, there's a lot of that where it's like, oh, it was undeveloped and then they did this and the budget was that. And then it's mm. just, a, and I know a lot of like film podcasts just like love that stuff. And for me, I was like, let's keep it moving. <laughs> you know, let's keep this moving. Let's talk about where the radical change happened. So that thesis was my North Star, right? Like, so I'm like, where was the radical change? What was the change? And how did it either change Star Trek or how did it change people or both preferably? Um, so yeah, some stuff had to go, you know what I mean? And some stuff that just, you know, and you know, you know, I'll, if I do another edition, I might be able to looking at it now, of course it's, you know, it's been out and now I'm all, now all I want to do is fix it, but <laughs> you know, um, that's sort of where I'm at now. Yeah. I, you did a great job with the flow of the book. Like, I feel like just talking about the magazines and like how fandom, like how Star Trek, like I really feel like Star Trek like was the first like huge fan, like when we think of fandoms today, like it, it really is. started fandom. Yeah, it is. I mean, this, I, I just, I did a podcast reaction 
to all this, there were a bunch of Star Trek news came out of San Diego Comic-Con last week. And it's so funny to me because in 1972, when the first Star Trek convention happened in New York City, it's like three times the amount of people there than were at San Diego Comic-Con in 1972. And that was a media product that was not even being sold to anybody, right? <laughs> like the Star Trek was not being sold to these fans who created these conventions. They were, it was a media product that kind of didn't exist, that was dormant. Uh, so there's something really genuine about that. <laughs> I'm always, yeah, you don't have Comic-Con and fan culture and cosplay and all that without Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Or if you do, it just, it, it happens in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. um, and even George Lucas, you know, it, you know, and this is in the book, you know, was like aware of the power that how that had brought fandom into the mainstream people think of it as being a cult thing but like you know people renting out giant hotels in new york city to do a giant convention with isaac asimov that's in that making like headlines that's mainstream news you know so yeah you don't have what we have with comic-con now without star trek fandom at all like period <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't have fandoms without Star Trek, which is why, you know, Star Trek is so important. And I think that anyone would love your book because it just touches on, you know, for Star Trek fans, there's so much there. Um, I loved like how you went into depth about the episodes and like behind a lot of the actors and their interviews. And there's and there's just so much like about like how we all connect in some way to Star Trek. I and mean, you don't need to be a super fan to like find these stories and anecdotal information is so interesting and it's so well researched too like mm -hmm. I could tell you really like did your work before the book came out so well thank you yeah I mean you know as I say you know at a certain point you have to finish a book so there are exactly. some things that I would have I would have liked to have lingered on um and yeah there's the thing with Star Trek also is now I'm like how often will I have to update this every two years every five years <laughs> we'll just we'll we'll see what they let me do <laughs> yeah definitely the update that would be really cool if we can get like some of that patrick stewart interview like maybe is like in a you know a bonus if you decide to release it again at some point and then well yeah i mean I, I you know i published the patrick stewart interview on inverse at the time but there were some personal things in there that occurred that i wasn't able to include you know you can't it's yeah. hard to include the personal things on, on articles you publish online mm -hmm. that's just yeah. that's i don't know why that is but that's just the way it is <laughs> I just want to, you know, thank you for making the time to talk to us and for writing this book. You know, I think it's just it's a really it's like very warm and cozy in a way for Star Trek fans, but also is like a little bit like challenging and mind expanding. Like it got me to think about some things in new ways. And I really appreciated that, too. Oh, well, that's really that is very kind. Thank you. <laughs> and we can tell you can tell how much we loved your book. And, you know, we hope that other, you know, of course, other people check it out. The book, the book has been released, right? 531. It came out in May. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it actually, is out. It's available. Yeah, it, uh, it actually came out the same week that Spock Amok aired. <laughs> oh, oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, um, yeah, no, it's out. It came out at the end of May. So it's been out for two months. Okay. It's yeah. been out, so like you can definitely um, check out your copy um, and find it in your local bookstore. And the title is Phasers on Stun, How the Making and Remaking of Star Trek Changed the World by Ryan Britt. And um, we are going to close this chapter of Turn the Page. I am one of your hosts today, Megan, and I had with me here today my co-host, Jen, hello, Jen, and our special guest, Ryan Britt. Thank you so much. It was so um, interesting and it was a fun conversation today talking with you about all things Star Trek and your book. And um, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, um, everyone. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode. Thank you.